Okay, welcome everyone. Welcome to the Hurley Investments Market View Commentary for Tuesday, the 13th of July. We had to do a little switch. We normally do these Monday evenings, 6 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. We had to do a little switch this week because of schedule. With that said, Thursday will be like normal at 10 o'clock for the trade findings and adjustments. Looks like we have a new person here. Looks like we have DD Sharp. DD, welcome. If you go to the question section, you should be able to type in questions here. We do have you muted. If you would like to unmute yourself or have me unmute you, just let me know. And we'll be good to do that. But we should be able to, everyone say welcome to Didi. Pleasure to have you here. Um, Bill cannot hear me. How about the rest of you? The rest of you should be able to hear me. Let me get a little text off to Bill here. Yep, I am coming across. Tell Bill to turn up the volume. Turn up the volume. All right, here we go. Tonight I'm going to go over how I make some of my decisions using pivot points and the Williams percent R. Basically, I am shocked how people are not using basic, 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 basic in any education you take level one type knowledge it just i don't understand it i don't understand it it shocks me that people get level one knowledge it's like oh i already know all that and then they don't use it and i sit there and i scratch my head and i figure what are you doing how could you not be using this type of information when you're doing what you're doing so let's take a quick look at pivot points plain and simple and i'm just going to highlight a couple things here uh, for me a pivot point is a series of support and resistance levels right that's all they are for me so as i'm looking at pivot points i'm looking at very short term levels of support and resistance let me pull up a chart so we can be able to see this i'm going to erase that here we have under armor and at under armor we have these pivot points i'm going to highlight them just so we can see them here is last month's. We have an R2 at 25.14. We have a resistance level one at 23.15. We have the pivot point itself that it's trying to fight to get against at 21.21. Our first support level is at 19.22, which matches pretty close to the 19.35 red line which is a 200 day simple moving average and then we have our last level down here at 1728 a second support level to kind of make it as simple as can be an r1 resistance level is like a half a let's see it is one standard deviation almost and an r2 is like one and a half standard deviations so that is the thought process behind pivot points we make some of our decisions based on the simple lines and those dollar figures if you remember we put on some protection last time at 2350 as we hit that pivot point we took it off 
down here at this pivot point. And then we missed the pivot point at uh, the 50 day moving average right here. We missed that as it was in no man's land. But our pivot points are shorter term, 30 day understanding of where stock prices can go. And they're really just short term support or resistance levels. I'm gonna let you guys read through this, but there is a limitation. Pivot points are based on a simple calculation. And while they work for some traders, others may not find them useful. There is no assurance the price will stop at, reverse at, or even reach the levels created on the chart. Other times the price will move back and forth to the level as with all indicators, they should be used as a part of a complete trading plan. So we use these levels partially because they match Fibonacci's to a certain degree, but more so because I like the one standard deviation level. Now, most of us, if I can go back to our, our chart here, most of us are gonna use the basic RSI with the median line, the 50 line is your bullish or bearish level. Right now, Under Armour would be considered bearish and it has been bearish since May. We also have at that same time a crossover on the MACD, the moving average convergence divergence. It almost lines up exactly. And then if we had the five and the 20 day simple moving averages, uh, the five and the 20 exponential moving averages, the nine and the 20 simple moving averages, the 15 and the 30, whichever moving average you choose to use, we'd most likely see crossovers almost lining up. And technically, Under Armour has been bearish since May. One reason why we first had a $24.5 long put in place. Now, Kevin, you're using a 50-day and a 200-day, which I am. I'm not looking at day trading. I'm a longer-term investor. I'm looking for stocks to move over a period of time. I'm looking for returns that are going to match, I don't know, significant returns, right? 100% returns. We're trying to double portfolios, as I've told all of you time and time again. We're trying to double portfolios every four and a half to five and a half years. A couple of years ago, some of you had doubled your portfolio in about three and a half. And there are a couple of you that have doubled a portfolio in two. With that said, the main goal is longer term. You'll notice I use a Williams percent R. For me, a Williams percent R is a medium stochastic. And let me go to where I've got information on Williams percent R for you so that we can be on the same page. A Williams percent R is nothing more than for me, a medium stochastic over a 14 day period. Key takeaways, it moves between zero and 100. A reading of negative 20 is overbought, negative 80 is oversold. Overbought and oversold readings doesn't mean the price will reverse. It's supposed to mean that though. Much like you would see Bollinger Bands, much like you would see it on an RSI. An overbought and oversold does mean that the price should reverse. It doesn't mean that it will. I use this because of Williams percent R, especially, got a little bit extra in here. Especially if you do a little 
research on it. For me, it's a great indicator that helps me understand where I think certain price stops are going to occur. And it's rather important for me because I feel, hold on. Where are they? The difference between a Williams percent and the fast stochastic oscillator. A Williams percent R represents a market closing level versus the highest high for that look back period. That's the main difference between, which makes it a median uh, stochastic. It also is a great indicator for on balance volume or institutional money. It almost always It almost always, as you cross above the overbought, you get that upward movement on your stock. As it crosses, excuse me, the oversold. As it crosses the oversold, it's up. Big bounce here, big bounce here. We have some little bounces. It still moves up. Big bounce, big bounce. I like using the Williams percent R in conjunction with pivot points because, yes, you can say uh, Under Armour bounced off of the 50 day right here. It was confirmed with the Williams percent R. The Williams percent R here is confirmed with a touch on a pivot point. Right here, confirmed with a touch on a pivot point. Right here, close, but it also matches the day here where we went above a pivot point. Crosses over, matches with another pivot point. I'm looking for information that will help me make my best educated guess on when and how to do protection. I also like the Williams percent R reverse. If we're overbought, it's going to head down. It's confirmed. Overbought, we head down. Overbought, we're heading down. Overbought, we're heading down. I'm now, I usually will use the line. I will just use the line as my indicator on which direction I think we're gonna go. And those pattern, patterns, as you take a peek at it, are just indicators to give me a better understanding of where I think things might go. Uh, someone just typed in, they also have a look at the RSI 14. So yes, they do match, except for time periods like this, where the RSI is rather sideways, rather sideways kind of rather sideways for a while. Right now, I've been looking at the bounce down off of the uh, the Williams percent R. So it's just a tool that I use for a confirmation. Um, it's not that I, how would I say it? I only use Williams percent R because it's what I used to use 25 years ago. It's what I am looking for to validate where positions are going. And I like to validate those with pivot point shorter term. And then I use the longer term institutional 50 day 
and 200 day simple moving averages. A lot of people ask me, Kevin, do you use the 100 day simple moving average? I do not. The only people that ever really use the 100 day are educations that do not trade real money. The people that talk on TV, that with all due respect, they might trade some real money, but it's a talking point. I've never heard of a 100 day simple moving average being used on any institutional terms, on any level, on any institutional firms, using any of those terms as their positioning or trading money. With that said, another thing that obviously I'm looking for, pretty nice on a day like today, right? Uh, the market ended with a $45,000 gain on a 0 0.35 on, what, $18.2 million roughly. I guess we should have been down around $58,000, but we were up 45. That's a $100,000 swing on a down day in today's stock market. Our non-student group, they were up $47,000 today on $16.4 million. They're doing a little bit better, but again, that swing is around $90,000 here. And Coda for Kiev was also up, only up $4,000 today. Not bad on the market that was down 0 0.35. He should have been down around 15. So it's pretty nice on an up day in the market, excuse me, on a down day in the market to be up. That's what we're looking for, and part of it goes to these uh, these positions that we're, we're actively trading. Now, a couple people asked me most recently, Kevin, why is Visa and the financials up until today, why are they doing so well? What is moving those financials? Going back, we talked about economic reports. Economic reports, again, is another pretty simple level one understanding of, of what could possibly be moving our stock market. Two weeks ago, we had the consumer credit report. I pay significant attention to it. The consumer credit report told me consumers borrowed $35.4 billion in May when the consensus was 19 billion. People started using their credit card again in May. Not only that, but the revision was higher for April. What does this mean? Key factors, right? Non-revolving credit, which includes auto loans, increased by $26.1 billion. Revolving credit increased by $9.2 billion. Consumer credit increased seasonally just annual rate of 10% in May. Revolving credit increased at an annual rate of 11.4%. So why is this important? What are the takeaways? Well, their key takeaway from the report is expansion consumer credit in May was the largest since December 2010. This was the largest one month explosion of consumer credit. Kevin, how does that relate to trading? Well, number one, uh, last month, I bought my wife a Ford Expedition Max Platinum car. She'd been driving around a Ford Econoline van for about 13 years to 200,000 miles. So first, I'm part of this report. <laughs> this report talks about me. This report shows me people 
we're spending in April and May significant amounts of money. What could people be spending money on right now? Or maybe think of it this way. If you were trapped inside for a year and a half, what would you go out and spend your money on? I kind of have four areas that I'm thinking of. There we go. Home improvement. Why would you say home improvement? But I definitely think that would be an area. And of course, if you've been trapped inside, there you go. Home improvement related to the sale of a home. We have homes at ridiculously high prices right now. So yes, I could totally see, William, home improvement being one of the things that people are out there spending their money on. So yes, if you're in a home improvement stock, I think you're in great shape. Uh, very easy to also say that, Mary. Autos, I agree with you. Automobiles, we already have an extended lag time. We've had a shortage of automobiles. When we went through the chip shortage, people in May ran out and bought an automobile. June will probably be the same. So automobiles would be a consumer credit. What else? Technology, I agree. I think technology would be a great consumer credit. If you've been stuck with the same phone, iPhone, for a year and a half, you're pretty close to getting a upgrade on a two-year contract. I agree 100%. Russ, I'll touch base on that on a quick second. And yes, the last one, entertainment. We just saw people spend $80 million to go to theaters to see the release of Black Widow from Disney. We also saw, saw Disney collect $60 million that they don't have to share 40% with AMC or movie theaters. But we just saw Disney collect $60 million For people who bought the movie on Disney Plus, the opening, even though we're in a pandemic and people are not quite going back out to theaters, Disney captured literally 75% of what they captured in the theaters. They captured 75% with their online Disney Plus. That means out of that $60,000, they don't have to pay 40% or more off to the theater change. No theater chain has access to that. No ACM, no Cinemark can say, hey, we want 40% of the take to show your movie theater. They just took $60 million and made more than the $48 million they probably made on the $80 million worth of people that purchased uh, the viewing of the show in the movie theaters. That is why we are in the positions we are in. We are waiting for things to take off. Um, someone made the comment, Kevin, it sounds like you're just waiting for some things to come back. And my answer to that individual is, that's exactly what I'm doing. I am waiting for Disney to get back up to 205. I've been waiting for Apple to get back to 144, and it just finished above it at 145. Now we made money on the way down on Apple. 
we did great. Boeing. Boeing's tanking right now, right? Let me show a quick example of what we're doing. Boeing shares lost ten dollars and nine cents. Give me a highlighter. Come on. Ten dollars and nine cents. We made up five dollars and seventy-five cents of that ten dollars down. Yes, the stock positions were down twenty-one thousand. We made up twelve thousand six hundred. Anything we make up on the way down is profit as things get higher and come back. We can use some of this to purchase more shares. Why do we purchase more shares? When things fall down, if we can get 20% more shares here, you have a 20% higher return when the stock price goes back up. Right now, this year, we are sitting back and waiting for our core holdings to come back. Apple's come back. Boeing has not. Baidu has not. Baidu fell from 355. We're only sitting at 185 today. 184.59 actually. Someone asked me, hey, isn't it risky and dangerous to own Baidu? Why are you in Baidu? I found an amazing article that I sh I'm going to share with you guys here. If I can just clean it up. China is cracking down on stocks that trade on U.S. exchanges. Here's what it means if you hold them. We had this discussion last week. Kevin. <laughs> Why is China doing this? Why are they making sure that they're using gap accounting principles? Why are they protecting their intellectual rights? Why are they making sure that China plays by a more level playing rule in the, the world economy? All the things we wanted China to do, China is now cracking down to do them. We have an interesting, interesting opportunity here with Baidu. Baidu is one of the eight Chinese government-owned companies. They are one that the government in China wants to see them make a killing. With that said, they're also starting to follow by the rules and gap principles that we wanted other countries to to enforce upon them there are at least 248 chinese companies listed on three major exchanges with a market capitalization of 2.1 trillion there are eight national level chinese owned enterprises listed in the u.s when you hear a state owned the government owns them the government has employees or their leadership that currently has significant amounts of money in those positions. Make sure you read through this article. Make sure you start to understand that in all reality, the current stocks are fine. Future IPOs like Diddy are going to get hammered. I truly have to admit, I love seeing uh kramer on cnbc eat some crow because he recommended diddy it was not a smart move to do do make sure you read this article it's going to give you a great understanding of what the risk is and what's happening with china and the ipos all right, let's keep going here. The market pulse. Last week, the S&P climbed almost a half a percent. We got it all in the, on the Friday session. 
we keep seeing these weekly highs. Well, the S&P wasn't even up a half a percent. So as interesting as I talked to someone golfing here recently, and as I talked to someone over the 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 July 4th holiday, I had two people say, oh, the stock market's killing it. It's up like 50%, right? Which I kind of giggled because we're still in that 14% range. No, the stock market has not been up 50%. But people, because of the media, keep thinking that the stock market will endlessly go up. It can't do that. We will have to have a pullback. We will have to have a correction. It will get a little ugly as we, as we again, are, are stimulusing ourselves out of a market correction. Alcoa reports this week was officially the start of earnings season. This week will also be the banks. That's why we make sure we have JP Morgan with protection and that we have Bank of America with protection. Uh, there are your earnings right there. I will update that before I post this. If we look at the Dow Jones Industrial Average, last week it was bullish. This week, it is still bullish, coming down to the median line, but the Dow Jones Industrial, actually this is the S&P 500, and that's not what I'm looking for. Let's insert today's chart. There we go. Sitting right in between the median line and the, the bearish line on the RSI, we are still technically bullish to start this earnings season. If we take a look at the S&P, also still technically bullish, but take a look at that RSI at the top here, just coming up to overbought. That coincides with overbought and Williams percent R. We also are hitting the R2 resistance line. We're more than one standard deviation above the S&P 500. We typically will see a pullback. And last but not least, we have the NASDAQ. And yes, I think the NASDAQ is also bullish. And the NASDAQ is overbought. So I get this question all the time. Kevin, indexes were not meant to be overbought. How long do you think we will be overbought in this position? And I'm just going to politely say earnings can extend an overbought um, an overbought technical indicator for a significant period of time. So if you're going to ask me where the markets are going to go, this is a bank earnings week. Uh, Goldman Sachs did amazing. We saw Bank of America tomorrow, but we'll see. Uh, JP Morgan did very good. I'm going to tell you our markets are going to end higher this week. I still think we'll only have a 3% up July. Earnings this week were JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, Pepsi, and Fastener are fast for today. Tomorrow, Citigroup, BlackRock, Delta Airlines, Wells Fargo, Bank of America. Thursday has Schwab, Morgan Stanley, U.S. Bank Corp, United Healthcare, and Alcoa. Friday, First Horizon National. Really, retail sales on Friday will be the big indicator for this week. Thursday, we'll probably have a mixed bag with Empire Manufacturing, Philly Fed, capacity utilization, industrial production. All those will kind of cancel each other out. I saw nothing internationally that uh, worries me. How am I looking to trade? Basically, we have added protection for earnings. That's it. Uh, I have a, so a couple interesting articles here. Disney attracts a bullish view from Morgan Stanley on long-term streaming parks potential. 
So that's long-term streaming video and the park's potential opening. Bank stocks dropped even as JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs earnings beat estimates. Do read some of the key points here. Tencent's own deal cleared by top Chinese regulator. Just an interesting um, anti-monopoly regulation that went on over in, in China. Why has Baidu hit its bump? It's a technical bump plus for the news, Tencent is 39% owned by Baidu. IQ is 30%, Alibaba is 30%. Uh, I wanna say Diddy's even 30%. They own everything. That's why that is the only stock that we're gonna be in for China. Disney gains 1%. As JP Morgan calls it its top pick, seeing recovery in theaters and parks. Disney's successful superhero streaming experiment raises surprisingly new possibilities. So do read through this. It really goes through their other movies that they have coming on, as well as some that they've let go. Some that they've let go. Some that they've already announced. So you can see where they might move to streaming at the same time they open up uh, these movies in a movie theater. So please pay attention. I find it very interesting to understand where China could go. All right, guys, what questions do you have if I can answer any? And Russ made the comment that materials are rather expensive right now. That is correct, which only increases profit margin for some of these uh, home improvement stores that have inventory on hand. Also, I've noticed a lot of people are willing to pay that extra because they can get that extra in their house prices right now. House pricing is just taking off. So pretty interesting that I would say there is an opportunity in the home depots of the world, the, the lows, just something to pay attention to. Um, Wells Fargo canceled their consumer credit line. Does that put... Uh, pretending does that for any problems credit problems in the future yes um, in all honesty Wells Fargo cannot get out of their own way Wells Fargo reminds me of Boeing they keep making mistakes and yes that will definitely hurt Wells Fargo as they're no longer having open consumer credit lines to make an interest off of Although I think Wells Fargo does a great job of lending to a lot of the, uh, how would I say this, to a lot of the unqualified borrowers. And I think they're finding out that their write-offs are becoming more than their interest they're receiving on those credit lines. Uh, Abraham, how do you see the healthcare sector? Um, I think the healthcare center sector can do good when we get back to offering more uh, oh, the surgeries, the uh, non-life-threatening. That's not the word I'm looking for. But, but I think when we start elective surgeries, we see more elective surgeries starting again, I think we'll be in good shape. Probably won't see that till more of next year until we get through a couple of these strains of the virus and we feel more protected. Mon, is that specific to Wells Fargo? As of right now, yes. Wells Fargo is the only bank that I know that has shut down consumer credit lines, primarily home equity lines of credit. Uh, I don't see available at Wells Fargo, whereas they are available for the other banks. Um, Bill. What sectors are most adversely affected by inflation, which is highest in 13 years? Uh, every sector. Inflation truly doesn't help uh, a sector. In fact, what it does is inflation weakens the value of the dollar. So it'll primarily hurt international companies, uh, companies that buy or sell internationally, like energy companies. Companies internationally that buy uh, materials to make their products. Inflation is a GDP killer. 
But right now, even though it's the highest in 13 years, especially with the uh, CPI numbers that came out today, do understand it's transitory. At least that's what we're led to believe by the Fed right now. So transitory just means that it's not a big worry yet. No reason to have to worry about inflation at this point in time. Uh, great questions. Are there any other questions? If there are not, thank you for being here. I appreciate you being here tonight. Pretty good to see a day. We're on 18 million. We're up on a down day in the stock market. And we were up all the way across the board. 46 there. Non-student accounts did good. And Key was up too. Pretty nice to see all the way across the board on a down day as we protected for earnings that are coming up. Diddy, I don't know if you know why we protect for earnings, but two weeks before an earnings event and four weeks after, that six-week period of time, 80 it's actually like 88%. I've been saying 83. 88% of the time, stocks in that time period can lose 20% or more of their value. And it's just due to them not meeting the earnings expectations that are placed on them from analysts. All right, I hope that was educational. I hope learning a little bit about what I'm using to make my decisions can help you see how your portfolios are being managed. Guys, have a wonderful evening. Pleasure being with you. I will look forward to seeing you Thursday morning at 10 o'clock for a trade findings and adjustments. Have a good night, and I will make sure I definitely will see you next Monday for the Monday commentary. It will be coming live to you from Gilbert, Arizona. Good night, everyone. Have a good evening. Bye-bye.